Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about reactions with diazonium salts. But before we get into that, let's go through the practice problems that I assigned last lecture. Now in this first question, we have this lithiated dithiane, and we nucleophilically open up an epoxide, forming this tertiary alcohol. Next, we treat this with rainy nickel, which just reduces the dithiane to a CH2, giving us the final product on the right. One of you figured out the joke uh, in this molecule here, and I'd encourage you to look at the pinned comments in the last episode if you didn't get the joke. In the next problem, I ask you to propose a starting material for the following transformation. Um, and then I also want you to show, based on this starting material, what would you get if you treated it with rainy nickel? And so there's two different possible starting materials you can imagine. You could either have the ketone right in the benzylic position or alpha to it right here. And this wolf kishner reduction would just afford the fully reduced product. However, if we were to treat this with rainy nickel, because rainy nickel reduces different functional groups, here we would actually just reduce away the two sulfurs, giving us the benzene with the ketone in the benzylic position or the alpha position as, uh, as is above. So these would be the two different products you obtain depending on which starting material you chose here. Now in the next problem, what we do is we have a multi-step synthesis. So initially this 1,3,5-trimethoxybenzene would react with acetyl chloride in the presence of aluminum trichloride, giving us this acetophenone product. We can then lithiate this uh, ketone with LDA, giving us the lithium enolate, which can then be trapped by benzyl bromide, giving us this functionalized product. Finally, this benzylic ketone is able to be reduced using a Clemenson reduction, giving us this final product here. And so this would be the compound that you would draw for this question. Now with that, let's get into today's material, the reactions of diazonium salts. So diazonium salts are extremely versatile. They're super awesome. You can make them into almost any functional group you want. And the reason for this is they're a really good leaving group. So you can access nitriles, thiols, halides, sulfonyl halides, fluorides. They can be reduced to hydrogens. They can be converted to phenols. And they can also be converted to boron-containing species. And so the way that we form diazoniums, if you recall from a previous episode, I briefly mentioned this, we just treat an aniline with a diazotizing agent. We can also prepare aliphatic diazoniums, but those tend to be way more reactive and way less stable, so they're only ever seen as transient intermediates. It's also possible to use inorganic nitrate, uh, nitrite or organic nitrites to achieve this transformation. They should say nitrite, not nitrate. Diazonium salts are generally unstable even if they're aromatic derivatives, you can isolate them, but you have to be very, very careful if you do, because these things are just dying to kick off nitrogen. And so if you have a nucleophilic anion present, anything around the nucleophilicity of chloride or more nucleophilic than chloride, then you'll start getting the reaction occurring. So if you want to form these and isolate them, it's better to use HBF4 as your acid so that tetrafluoroborate is your counter ion, and those are, tend to be relatively stable. So the way that this reaction happens is first, nitrite is treated with an acid, which forms nitrous acid, which can then be further protonated and dehydrated to create the nitrosonium uh, cation. Now, this only occurs if you use a really strong acid. So then this nitrosonium is able to be attacked by the aniline, forming this N double bond O species, which can isomerize to form this diazo hydroxy compound, which upon treatment with a strong acid eliminates water, forming the diazonium. If you wanted to access an aryl halide, and if you wanted to do any substitution reaction of these in general, they tend to be known as Sandmeyer reactions. Now some people are real sticklers for this, and they'll only consider it a Sandmeyer reaction if you are using a copper 1 salt in conjunction with your nucleophile. However, more commonly, people will just generally refer to the substitution of a diazonium with a nucleophile as a Sandmeyer reaction. So if you wanted to just form these in situ, and then trap them out, you can just add an HX, where X could be bromide or iodide or chloride. However, if you want to make a chloride or a bromide, you typically need to add in a copper salt, where iodides don't need a copper salt. Iodide is nucleophilic enough that it can do this SNAR substitution reaction very easily. If you wanted to make the aryl fluoride, you have to just make the BF4 salt and pyrolyze it or treat it with photochemical conditions to afford the fluorides. Now, if we're doing that reaction and we're making an aryl fluoride, it's called the balls schemann reaction. And uh, some of these variants have their own specific names. So here, this is the balls schemann reaction. 
Now, if we wanted to do uh, these reactions with copper, you can do this for, in general, any of these nucleophiles, but you don't usually require them for making thiols or iodides. You can also make phenols with or without copper, but if you use copper, these reactions will go under milder conditions. So here's an example of the synthesis of an aryl bromide. First, we take this SF5 containing aniline. The SF5 motif is an emerging uh, it's an emerging functional group in medicinal chemistry, as this is fairly nonpolar, but it's a little bit bigger than a CF3. So this can be like a useful motif, but methods to synthesize these and building blocks with them present tend to still be relatively uncommon. However, we're improving our methodology and reactions such as this enable access to more and more derivatives. So here you can see that copper bromide is necessary uh, to achieve this transformation, but they also use HBr in the previous step to just kind of get a little bit more bromide in solution. Now in this next case, we treat it with HCl and sodium nitrate, so we're forming a, a diazonium chloride in the first step, and then the potassium iodide is added in the second step, and the iodide is just going to displace the diazonium, giving us this aryl iodide product. Now in this example, they use HCl, copper chloride, in 1,4-dioxane and water, and all in one pot, both steps occur, where the chloride is just displaced, or, or the chloride displaces the diazonium, rather. It's also possible to make aryl fluorides, as I was suggesting before, using HBF4. However, they have to pyrolyze the salt in refluxing toluene at 100 degrees. But you can see that these methods still tend to tolerate a lot of functional groups. Now, in this case, because they make the HBF4 salt, they can improve their yield just by isolating the salt. It's not very water soluble, so they can get rid of all the water and put it in anhydrous toluene so that they only form the aryl fluoride and they don't make any phenol product there. So if you wanted to do other types of Sandmeyer reactions, you could make aryl thiols using um, sulfur-based nucleophiles. Alternatively, you could treat the diazoniums with water to get phenols. You could also reduce away the NH2 as like a temporary protecting group so that you get a CH. It's possible to synthesize nitriles, which is known as the Rosemann von Braun, or Brown if you're a German uh, Brown synthesis. Uh, sulfonyl chlorides can be made using sulfur dioxide and borylation can occur using B2PIN2. So an example of thiolation is the use of potassium ethyl xanthate. This is commercially available, but it's very easy to prepare just using uh, potassium ethoxide in the presence of carbon disulfide. And so essentially this whole sulfur thing just displaces the diazonium. Now, if you're wondering how you convert this to a thiol, you can just treat it with sodium hydroxide, and these go relatively easily. This is a fairly electrophilic center. In the next example, we can see another conversion to a uh, xanthate derivative. This can also just be easily hydrolyzed. In this compound here, we convert an aniline into a phenol. And so what they do is they make the diazonium sulfate, which precipitates, they wash it out, put it in fresh uh, anhydrous sulfuric acid, and they reflux it to get the phenol. So you can see this is rather harsh, whereas using copper and water at room temp could be more favorable especially as you get to more and more complex substrates. Now, in this case, they uh, convert this aniline also to a phenol under similar conditions that are slightly different. So if you would like to make a nitrile, while these are less common in the literature, they're still relatively well known. They're also fairly widely seen in patent literature. Here, they can just create copper, cyanide, and situ. Um, in the first step, they just create the diazonium chloride, as in most cases. Then in the second step, they add in their cyanide in benzene, and then they reflux to get their nitrile. Alternatively, you could do the same reaction with pure copper cyanide directly, just on a different substrate as shown here, giving us this nitrile product. Now, if you wanted to just get, get rid of the nitrogen, delete it out of the molecule, what you can do is treat it with sodium nitrite, HCl, get the diazonium chloride, and then treat it with hypophosphorous acid, which is just a good hydride donor, essentially. And this will just reduce it right away. This also works on more complex substrates, as in the case of this uh, antihistamine derivative shown here. Now, if you'd like to make a sulfonyl chloride directly, it's actually fairly straightforward to do this. So you create the diazonium chloride, and then you treat it with sulfur dioxide in the presence of copper, one, and chloride. The sulfur dioxide essentially acts as a nucleophilic trap in the presence of these reagents, and then the chloride helps clean it up and finish off the copper. And so these are relatively easy to prepare, and this is a clever approach for synthesizing sulfonyl chlorides that's not usually discussed. In this next example, we can see the same transformation under slightly different conditions using copper 2 chloride, 
presumably which is just getting reduced in situ by the sulfur dioxide. Now, if you wanted to accomplish borylation, which is really useful for reactions like the Suzuki coupling or other cross-coupling reactions using palladium or other metals, you can actually do this from a diazonium as well. And so B2Pin2, one of these borons can be like a nucleophilic boron, the other boron is uh, an electrophilic boron. And so overall, you're able to just convert the diazonium directly to uh, B-pin group. And so if you wanted to convert this to a different boronic acid, you can just like treat this with base or KHF2 if you wanted to get the BF3 minus salt. But these can be easily converted into other boron containing species. Another example from this paper is the conversion of this uh, meta bromo species into a B-pin group. And so this is actually like a useful reaction to keep in your back pocket. And so with that, I'd like to assign a few practice problems for this lecture. First, starting with toluene, convert this to the molecule shown on the right. There's not one correct answer for these because there's many possible different synthetic pathways that could work. I just want to see reactions that that would theoretically work. You might come up with a different synthesis than I do, and that's totally okay. In the next problem, I want you to start with thymol, which is like over 50% of the constituent of thyme, if you use the, the seasoning thyme. This is the main constituent. Convert this to the corresponding catechol, which is a 1,2 diol on a benzene ring. In this final problem, I want you to convert this acetophenone containing aniline and convert this to a resorcinol, 1,3 uh, dihydroxyarene. And so with that, I hope that this has been a useful reaction that really highlights the utility of diazonium salts. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below, and it would really help out the channel if you left a like and subscribed. Have a great day.